Hi, I'm John Paul Cavanigra. I'm Sean Duggan. Sean, what is this thing? <laughs> this is a wooden box, which is a magic box, which <laughs> is a, a retro device for, for making these things that we call photographs these days. This is a pinhole camera that I use for one of my bodies of work, and it's a, a wooden pinhole camera. We'll just take this off here. And there's the, the shutter. Should open that up a little bit <laughs> Very high tech. Very high tech, but it's a great depth of field. It's F235. So, great depth of field. And uh, it's great. It's a multi format pinhole camera. We can open up the top here and use medium format film. And I can move these little slides around in here to change the aspect ratio uh, of the negative. Move these around. So I usually use it at uh, at the maximum size, which is six by nine centimeters. Yeah. But um, do you find you crop these often, or? Um, I crop them occasionally. I do not crop them for the um, the main body work that I'm using these for. I use these full frame, and I don't crop them. So there's some some notches in here that are for the little wooden slots. It's a little wider, longer. Yeah. Format. Yeah. So I don't crop it. And uh, the challenging thing about this is that there's um, there's no viewfinder on the camera, so it's not like using a regular camera. There's no lens. Is, is at f two thirty five two fifty three? Yeah. Is anything ever out of focus? You know, it's the way pinhole is. It's it's um, everything's in focus, but everything is also just slightly soft. It doesn't have the tack sharpness you would expect from a a glass lens, you know, a nice optic lens. Hmm. Although this pinhole camera is remarkably sharp. Hmm. I mean, I have a, a photographs of clocks in the snow, and you can see the individual, you know, snowflakes. I mean, not on a microscopic level, but you can see the individual granular pieces of snow falling from the clocks. So it's pretty amazing. So this isn't the only camera you use. I know you use an iPhone. An iPhone, and, of course. And a DSLR. And a DSLR, yes. Yeah. How do you choose? Why do you choose one over the other? Well, you know, it's it's a uh, each camera is a different experience, uh, a different user experience in, in using them, and I really appreciate the different experiences that the that each camera gives me. And for me, photography is uh, about much more than the finished product, which is the print typically, although that is the permanent record of the experience that I made had while making the, the picture. Mm. So I really appreciate the experience. I really appreciate the journey of, of making the image, which can start in the conceptual stage, thinking about it, planning about it. Or it can be you know, a spontaneous experience where I'm just out and about and I find something that's compelling and photograph it. So you're having a different head trip, or you get a different Head trip, there's, there's a good word for it. Does, does that actually get into the image, and is that experience or aspects of that experience? those qualities translated to the person who sees the final image. Because the viewer really doesn't they often don't know. know sure. unless you tell them. Mm -hmm. And and ultimately, should they care? I don't know if you want them to care. No, I don't think that they should care. The yeah, I don't think that they should care because when it comes down to it, I think that the image needs to, you know, stand on its own, regardless mm -hmm. of how it was made. You know, and, and I don't think that the viewer should get caught up into making judgments about the image based on the type of technology that was used to create it. Sure. I think there's a lot of that that goes on, and, and probably has always gone on in photography. Yeah. Gear-itis. Yes, gear-itis, <laughs> or even digital-itis, you know, where some people discount you know, images that are edited with digital technology because it's not pure, that whole thing, you know, which is you know, a dead horse by now, but some people still insist on being it. My absolutely favorite quote from Ansel Adams is there's nothing worse than a sharp picture of a fuzzy concept. Exactly, exactly. So, that's, that's so true. Or David Duchenne says, uh, gear's good, vision's better. That's a great one, yeah. yeah. It's true. Yeah. And because you can have the best gear in the world and still not be doing much with it. I don't know what to do with it. Right? Yeah, and you can have a photographer who has a plastic camera or a, an iPhone or a pinhole camera or, or even just you know a consumer level digital point and shoot, you know, Canon Rebel or something entry-level Nikon and is doing great work. So yes. it's, it's definitely, it's not the, not the gear, it is the, the vision behind it. Yeah. But in terms of, of your question is, you know, does the experience of using this uh, or the 
um, the type of gear I'm using, does that make its way into the final image? You know, I'm not thinking of that consciously when I'm creating those images, but I expect that in some cases it, it is definitely making it in there because at least with the pinhole, the, the experience is much more contemplative and meditative. I mean, there's a lot of uh, kind of pre-visualization or pre-thought that goes into making these images. Although sometimes in other projects it's just a little bit more spontaneous. I'll carry it around and make pictures on a spontaneous, spontaneous basis. So how do you choose? You have three cameras or more. Mm -hmm. Which one do you pick up in any given situation? Um, you know, it, it kind of ebbs and flows. It goes in waves. Uh, you know, I, I have not used this camera that much this year. The last time I photographed for my main uh, project that I'm doing with this, which is a series of still lifes in the landscape called Artifacts of an Uncertain Origin, I photographed in the Florida Keys last January, and that's really the last time that I photographed. Mm. Before that, I was in Death Valley photographing. So I'm kind of taking a break from that at the moment. Uh, still working on scanning some negatives that I need to work on uh, here. How do I choose? A lot of it's just based on what I'm photographing, what the content is, what my intent for the image is. Um, you consider of, one more serious than another, or one needs more antique quality, or one you need to slow down more for? Well, this is definitely more of a slow down process. It's really more of a journey to make the image. The images that I'm making with this involve a lot of sometimes travel, sometimes backpacking into an area, snowshoeing into an area, carrying props to set up. So it's a much more, it actually has a lot more in common with I think a film shoot because I'm doing location scouting, or finding a good place to take the picture and bringing all my stuff and setting it up, waiting for the weather to get good. I mean, not that photographers don't wait for the weather to get good with other cameras, but it's a lot more kind of step intensive. And you know, that part of the process I enjoy. I enjoy the entire journey of making these images from starting to have the concept of them and thinking about them and gathering the props, the artifacts, thinking about where I might photograph them. So I kind of enjoy all of that experience in making the image. And the end result is just the, you know, the record of that. But it definitely is you know, the journey, I think, that I enjoy a lot on this one. Ultimately, I think all of our journeys get into our images. Sure, yeah. I know, I'm down to two cameras, the iPhone and the DSLR. Mm -hmm. And if I find myself making the kinds of finished images that I might exhibit with my iPhone, I often check myself to why exactly am I doing right. this. And by the same token, if I start putting those same expectations and getting into those same habits mm -hmm. with the iPhone, I feel like I'm not pushing it enough. Right. I consider the iPhone a fantastic sketchbook. Sure. And I'm pushing myself to think in new ways, to try new things, to photograph things I wouldn't ordinarily. Right. To photograph them in new ways, to be much more experimental than I ordinarily would be. Right. Having to find a niche that I'm known for, that is successful, that I right. get certain responses from, good responses. But the iPhone is a way of pushing my envelope. Getting sure. my brain thinking in different ways. I do find that those experiments ultimately give me a greater sense of clarity about what I do in the other tool. Right. And often plant seeds sure. for ideas and techniques that I might repurpose in an entirely different way yeah. in the other tool. I think it's easier like with the iPhone, as you said, it's the sketchbook, and I feel that way too, because you know, currently my uh, oeuvre of <laughs> iPhone pictures is just all over the map in terms of, you know, color, black and white, you know, kind of rough and grungy or nice and pristine and collages and multi-image composites, but but that's sort of, I'm in the, the exploration and discovery phase of the tool, so, you know, it's it's uh, important that I push it into every single direction and see what its limitations are, where it excels as a creative tool, where it's not so great, and and I find that it's, it's like, easier to, to, uh, to fail with that tool, because, you know, because it's, you know, it's just an iPhone, so it's easier to try something out, it doesn't work, and think, okay, it doesn't work, but I had a good time doing it, you know? Right. And, and, and that little experience, even if it doesn't work, but totally falls apart, it feeds into your other creative work with other cameras that you're using or, or whatever creative tool you're using. Absolutely. And I think the fear of failure is uh, something we all need to really fight. Yeah. I know that uh, great creators like Thomas Edison had a quota for failure. And if he felt he wasn't failing a certain number of times a month, he wasn't pushing his He wasn't trying hard enough, it's true. And I think once you get a certain number of successes and, and 
get your tools, technique, and even voice down. A lot of times there's the temptation to stop pushing that on. Mm -hmm. Go to the zone you know you're successful in. Sure. And it can slow growth. Yeah. Uh, well, I've had, some set yeah, I've had experiences with, with uh, this camera here where, you know, I've you know, pretty much gotten, in, gotten a certain type of picture down where I can nail it every time. And then I would, you know, I'm always trying to push it out like, okay, well, what else can I do with this to show the landscape in a different way or show the, the subject I'm photographing in a different way? How can I push it? Because I would, I would get bored with what I was doing and trying to push it. And sometimes, you know, I would fail spectacularly with it. <laughs> but from those failures, you know, I typically learned something. You know, I learned, and often I found, at least creatively, that oftentimes you learn more from the failures than you do from the, the ones that you nail right off the bat. Absolutely. And that, you know, informs your, your further work. Right. Particularly you translate into a future success. Yeah, exactly. I find the hardest thing is not to fail at the same thing twice. <laughs> <laughs> to make a new failure. To make a new failure. Yeah, you got to well, I failed in the exact same way. i got to fail in a different way. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, and, and, and I think a lot of people, you know... And as you say, they fear failure, or they oh, it doesn't work, and they, and they get disappointed. Whereas, what I try to do, you know, obviously, if if you invested a lot of emotion and expectation into trying an idea out, and it doesn't quite hit the mark or it falls short, it's natural to feel a little bit of disappointment there. But, but you know, it's it's more important just to move beyond that and say, okay, this failed, but you know, why did it fail? How can I make it, you know, not fail in the future? What did I learn from it? You know. Is, is this uh, merely a stepping stone and I'm only two more steps away from a success or do I just need to change direction? It's all, you know, if you look at it in that light, it can all be, you know, good grist for the creative mill. Well, you just got the key there. If you look at it, if you do that follow-up and review time. Right. So many times I see people looking at their contact sheets and just going, oh, oh, oh. Right. And not going through the process of these are consistent mistakes I make. There's an opportunity for growth. Right. Or this picture didn't work in a picture perfect way, but there's the seed of an idea that's sure. really interesting. Mm -hmm. And if I could only improve these aspects, right. that idea would be fantastic. Exactly. Be a breakthrough. So the review process you talked about, why? What can I learn from this? Yeah. I think it's really critical. Yeah. And, and fuels growth. And and as you said, you know, it's important what you see. It's like Thoreau said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, because that's just, you know, we can all look at the same thing, but, you know, what do we see in it? And, and, and is what we see something that we can pull out and apply to our creative work and, you know, find growth through that? Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. As always, great catching up with you. Cool. Yeah. Take care. So, you can find out a lot more on both of our websites, John from Cafe Negro. And SeanDuggan.com.